Good morning. Thank you for joining us this morning for our Governor's Summit weekly, uh, monthly webinar series. Uh, the topic is today, the Poison Center Landscape During the Continuing Opioid Crisis, Problems You Might Not Consider. Uh, I'm Gordon Smith, the, the, st the state's director of opioid response. Really appreciate you taking time on this late fall day to, to join us for an hour. Um, I want to note that the that the next webinar will be December 1st, um, same time, 1130 to 1230. And the topic will be our recovery friendly workplaces initiative with representatives from Pine Tree Institute and the Portland Recovery Community Center. Hope you'll all be able to join us for that. I do want to start this morning by doing a moment of silence for our the victims of our, our the casualties last week in Lewiston. Three of those victims were from my hometown of Winthrop, where I sit today. Um, but but I also, with this audience, want to note that that and I, I mean no um, criticism at all of all the resources that are being devoted to the city of Lewiston and Auburn and the many needs that are there, particularly in the behavioral health area and the crisis response. But we also had 19 uh, fatal overdoses the week before across the state. That was a particularly bad week, frankly. We're doing better uh, week by week generally than last year, but the congruence of the two numbers really stuck in my mind that um, we had 19 people lose their lives also and 19 families disrupted. So let's have a moment of silence for both groups of 19 people. Thank you. Before introducing our really terrific speakers today, I, I also want to thank Lorena Liberty and Madison Barassa for helping to keep these uh, monthly webinars together. Thank you, Madison and Lorena. We um, also, if you have questions today, uh, please put them in the question and answer spot on the Zoom and not in the chat room. We will answer some of those as we go along. I suspect because of the significant amount of material we have, we probably won't get up to all the questions. So I remind you that not only is the entire uh, hour recorded and available to everyone within a few days of, the, of today, but we also will answer every single question in writing if we don't get to them today on the Zoom. Um, our primary speaker uh, is Karen Simone. Um, she's a clinical toxicologist with a doc doctorate in pharmacy with over 30 years of experience. She is the director, currently the director of the Northern New England Poison Center, which is located in Portland, but serves the states of Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. It's been a terrific resource for the people in these three states for a long time. Karen came to Maine roughly 20 three years ago, and we're very blessed to have her. Um, as I say, she's got over 30 years of experience in drug information and poisoning, including cases involving behavioral health and substance use. Virtually all of that work has been in Ohio or Maine. Uh, she's also an assistant professor of emergency medicine uh, at Tufts University School of Medicine. And I think significantly for those of you in our audience today, um, she is the vice chair of the Maine Behavioral Health uh, Board. Um, we have over 300 people registered today, and uh, there's great interest in the talk. I think the intersection of Dr. Simone's work and our own work and all of your work is fascinating, and that you'll um, learn some things that you hadn't thought about. She also is uh, will be introducing and having a brief interview with, uh, with Dr. Rob Palmer, who is a clinical toxicologist in Colorado. Really, he's also a paramedic. He's been a law enforcement officer, um, has had an extensive background in this area. We really appreciate him joining us virtually from Colorado today. So I think those are all my announcements. 
uh, Dr. Small, we're so appreciative of you taking time to do this with us. And um, I'm going to turn it over to you. Well, thank you very much for joining me, everyone who's out there. And um, I will do my best to make your time uh, useful for you today while we do this. Um, in full disclosure, Dr. Palmer, in addition to being an excellent clinical toxicologist with some special some specialty area in forensics, um, is my husband. Um, so I know that he's got a lot of information that will be very helpful to you, but I invited him to be here today because at the end, I want to talk a little bit about naloxone and fentanyl, um, which are um, areas of expertise for him. And he has hands-on experience um, with some of the things that can go wrong. Um, I'm here for the Poison Center, and um, I'm going to be talking about when things are a problem, not when they go well. I think we all understand that sometimes things go great, and that's terrific. But when the Poison Center is involved, usually something has gone wrong. So today, that's what we're going to talk about. And I'll try and keep it as light as I can, because it seems like we have a lot of serious situations in our state right now, and this is just one of them. So today, what I'm going to try and do is describe the trends in the opioid poisoning in adults and children. And I've been asked to provide a little bit of additional information on cannabis too, since that's a growing issue. And since there's, there's crossover with opioids and cannabis sometimes. I'm going to start with little kids because I think it's important for people to have that information. And then um, we'll go on to talk about some of the issues with adults, especially um, adults with opioid use disorder who also are using stimulants now. We really have a polysubstance use issue and it creates additional and some new concerns when we're working with these guys. And um, I also want to discuss problems with medications that are used to manage opioid addiction or overdose. And specifically, I'll be concentrating on naloxone and buprenorphine because we have a, a fair number of poisonings that come, especially from buprenorphine, but some problems associated with naloxone too. And I think since there's so much of both of those things out there in growing amounts, it's good for everybody to be familiar with when things go wrong, what goes wrong and is there something that we can do to prevent it? Because, you know, most poisonings are preventable. So I'm hoping when you leave today, you'll have some new tools and some information that's useful. Um, we don't have any disclosures. We don't own companies that sell naloxone or um, a lab that's making fentanyl. So I think that everything we tell you is pretty much without bias today. Um, I thought I'd start with just a little bit of information on the Poison Center in case you're not familiar with it. We are the Northern New England Poison Center. We serve Maine, New Hampshire, and Vermont. So a little more than 3 million people. Um, the Poison Center, when you call, it's 24 by seven. If you call at 3 a.m. on Christmas, we are there. You're not waking us up. Somebody is awake and they're busy all night long. Um, at least a quarter of our calls are from healthcare providers, mostly at hospitals. And we do everything from uh, dealing with children or adults who are poisoned in their home to um, hospitals who have people who've overdosed with uh, self-harm attempt or substance use issue or anything really. And things are going very bad very quickly and they need specialty advice. So when you call, who do you get? You get a nurse or a pharmacist with um, clinical and physician toxicologists on backup. And all of those individuals are certified or boarded in poisoning or toxicology. So it's, it's a healthcare provider and it's not just a nurse or just a pharmacist or just a physician. It's somebody who has special training specifically in poisoning or toxicology. So the key thing that we do is help people through the hotline. We take emergencies and we take questions. It doesn't have to be an emergency. It can be someone just prescribed me buprenorphine and my doctor wants to give me these two new drugs. Is that going to interact with the buprenorphine in a way that might make me sick? We can answer those questions for you. And then we do surveillance, which is why today I'm able to talk to you about some of the things that go wrong. And we do a little bit of research um, to try and help make management better in the future. And you can see right here, that is one of our actual poison specialists entering information on a computer and answering the phone. Um, the calls are confidential here in case you wondered and you don't have to tell us who you are when we talk with you. I thought it would be good to just give you a few examples of things we could do, especially to, in relation to what we're going to talk about today. Um, first scenario, my two-year-old ate the ADHD medications I left out for her sister. What do you do? 
you call us, we'll walk you through. Can you watch at home for effects or is that something that needs to go to the hospital? Do you need an ambulance or can you drive? That one phone call to us immediately hooks you up with a qualified person who can tell you that. Um, my 79 year old mother took the THC gummy I gave her to help her sleep. And I think it's interacting with her blood pressure medication. We have a fair number of calls about older adults whose adult children are giving them edible THC and either the dose is too high or it's contributing to heart problems or dizziness and falls. And so, you know, we're there to help when you have those questions and things went wrong. And quite frankly, at the Poison Center, I don't care whether THC recreationally is legal in your state or not. If you call us, we will help you. Um, this is another one. We're really set up for humans. We don't have any veterinarians at the Poison Center, but because it costs money to call the veterinary poison centers, a lot of people will ask us questions about their pets. And if we're able to answer the question by providing information about the animal that we have in our databases or references, we'll do that. Um, when I was looking through our poisonings, I was surprised to see a fair amount of exposures, dogs eating the box of naloxone. Um, who knew, right? And um, the good news is the naloxone tends not to be a problem for the dog unless they take opioids, which is unusual. Um, and opioids on a regular basis, but the box or the naloxone itself could be an obstruction hazard, just like any object a dog would swallow if it doesn't pass okay and it gets stuck somewhere. Um, if you took buprenorphine that your friend gave you and now you feel jittery and like you're gonna vomit, that's something you can call us about. Um, the new guy at work ate marijuana brownies someone brought in during break, not realizing they had marijuana in them. He's giggling a lot, and oh, by the way, he operates a big forklift. Is that going to be a problem? And then we get a fair number of questions about urine screens. My patient's urine is positive for methamphetamine. Can that be from the Adderall I'm prescribing, or is it a sign that the patient is actually using meth? So the poison center is there for all kinds of questions. And before we dive into the real information, and I'm going to go fast, so I'm going to touch on everything very lightly to make sure that you get a good overview, but I'll key in on things that I think are important. There's a guy named Paracelsus who I think lived in the 1500s, long, long time ago, who is an alchemist, a physician, and an astrologer all at the same time, which kind of puts you in the time period where those things were common. And something that he said that's very important to our talk today and just in general, all things are poisons for there is nothing without poisoning qualities or poisonous qualities, and it's only the dose that makes the poison. And that's why Naloxone is something people think of as a life-saving medication, but it can be a poison depending on the dose and how it's used. And we're going to talk about that. And with buprenorphine, even though it's used to help people recover, there are times that that causes problems too. And it's all about the dose. So it's important to think about this as we're talking. So let's start with some kiddo poisonings um, and how substance use and kiddos are a bad mix. And in Poisoning is a general rule. Whenever there's more of something around, more kids will get poisoned because they interact with everything in their environment. So we've got more cannabis around than we ever did and more opioids around than we ever did. And so it's become a problem with kids. Now, if you look at our poison center cases, so these are cases, a one-year period, this recent, just in the state of Maine, kids that are less than six years old. So those are if kids are anywhere from zero to five years old, they're interacting with their environment most of the time when they're getting poisoned. And you can see that the most common things are personal care products and cosmetics like lipstick, perfume, um, you know, shampoo, things like that. Foreign bodies and toys, they put them in their mouth. Sometimes they swallow them. Right now, those water absorbing beads are a problem for us. Household cleaners, because they're everywhere analgesics like Tylenol or aspirin or ibuprofen, plants, dietary supplements. So all of these things, you don't see anything in this list of most common poisons for kids um, that is a substance that's used to get high for the most part, maybe analgesics, but a lot of that is acetaminophen and aspirin and over-the-counter stuff. But if you look at the same data, and actually I used all three states here because I didn't want anything to stick out too much. I wanted to give you a good picture. If you look at the poisonings involving young kids like that, that either kill them or make them so sick that without intervention, they could have died, that list looks completely different. And if you look at that list, the biggest substances are at the bottom here, opioids and cannabis. So the things that cause the most serious poisonings in little kids are opioids and cannabis. 
And then if you break down the opioids, fentanyl is here, which you would expect. But how about buprenorphine? That is the number one issue that we have, and we're putting that out everywhere. So I think that it's worth talking about buprenorphine, fentanyl, and cannabis, and little kids, because not only every, it seems that especially in the beginning when cannabis was more in homes as it is now, um, everybody thought it was a big joke if a small child got into a cannabis product and they'll just get high. And I'm here to tell you, it's not a joke. It actually can be serious sometimes. So let's talk about that. With buprenorphine, let's start with that. Um, this is a study. It's not from our poison center, but what's in the study is consistent with what we see. The most common thing we see when kids get into buprenorphine is vomiting. Their pupils can get small. A lot of times they get drowsy. 83% um, of the kids in this study were not breathing well and 28% were not getting enough oxygen. So not only were they not breathing a well, it was bad enough that they weren't getting enough oxygen. 41% um, needed to be admitted to an intensive care unit and 41% needed naloxone. Most kids have problems breathing in less than two hours um, or just over eight hours. But I can tell you, we've had some very scary cases here at the Poison Center in Northern New England and in Maine, in which children might look a little bit drowsy or basically okay, and then have a problem breathing while they're in the hospital being monitored more than 12 hours after they got into the buprenorphine. And it doesn't take much. It can be a bite, a taste. Um, kids suck on pills, so even if you get the pill out of their mouth, they still can get enough to be a problem, and they're getting it the way they're supposed to. You would take a dose. They're sucking on it. And... Um, you know, it, any amount of buprenorphine in a child is potentially dangerous and requires usually an overnight admission at the hospital so we can make sure that if they start not breathing well, that they won't die from that um, or have any permanent effects from that. So it's a big, big deal. So you need to call us and these children who get into the buprenorphine need to go into a hospital. We need to do our best to keep them from getting into it. And you may hear that, well, buprenorphine doesn't kill anyone. You have to remember, children are not just small adults. Children are different. And even though most adults, if all they take is buprenorphine, are probably going to breathe, although they still need some medical attention if they take too much. Um, if an adult mixes buprenorphine with other things that makes them make them drowsy, they can stop breathing. And for children, they can stop breathing from buprenorphine and nothing else on board, and it can be very delayed, which is why it's never safe to leave these at home to just watch the kiddos at home. And you can see, these are some national data. This is not from our poison center alone. It's from multiple poison centers. But if you look at, for the number of prescriptions out there, how many deaths are there, buprenorphine had a few deaths. And over many years, um, these are young kids, less than six years old. You know, you may not think five deaths are too many, but I'd say that's too many. It's, it's frightening to me. So this is just to encourage you to take this very seriously if children get into the buprenorphine. Um, the, the things that I can tell you that are important about kids getting into opioids is there are certain things when they evaluated these 28 deaths that they noticed that were common factors that are things you can work on when you're trying to prevent these. Um, more than a quarter of these kids were being supervised by somebody who was not their parent. Um, and this is one that's especially concerning to me a lot of these ingestions that led to death were supervised, were actually seen. In other words, the person with the child knew that the child got into the opioid, but they didn't seek medical treatment for the child, almost 40%. And I think people are afraid to be arrested. They're afraid they're going to get into trouble. We've had cases in Northern New England where this has happened and led to a death with a kid getting into an opioid. Uh, it can be fentanyl, heroin, buprenorphine, whatever it may be. The children can die from this, and part of what contributes to that is not getting help. And yes, someone's going to say something that a child got into an opioid, but you're going to get into a whole lot more trouble if they die, and children's deaths are looked at very closely. It's going to be found out. So I think anything you can say to people you're working with to convince them that opioid ingestion in children, even in any small amount, is so serious, and they need to seek medical attention, can help prevent some of these deaths. Once they get to the hospital, a warning for clinicians, a couple of these deaths were due to kids who weren't observed long enough and they got sent home and then died later. 
So they need to be observed for long enough. A couple cases involved kids being given opioids to sedate them, and one was a healthcare provider error. Um, a big theme in a lot of these poisonings is that the drugs were not stored safely. They were around where the kids could get into them. So my advice for preventing opioid poisoning in kids is to educate the parents regarding the seriousness. And I know that sounds like an idiotic thing to say, but I can tell you from conversations that we have, not everyone is aware that even a small amount of a buprenorphine just in the mouth for a second can potentially be a problem. And I cannot say enough times these things need to be locked up where kids can't reach them and where kids can't see them. Um, a large number of our buprenorphine exposures right when the um, strips came out were due to the parent or the person in the house with buprenorphine taking out the strip and cutting it in half and taking half then and half later. And the kids were getting into it out of the safety package when it was sitting around or in a purse or on a table or something like that. So, you know, extra discussions with buprenorphine receiving patients about how important it is to make sure that's not where kids can reach it. Um, and then, you know, access. Um, when pills spill and you think you got them all, but maybe you missed one or two, purses are a real hazard. People keep a lot of stuff in their purse and kids get into them. Um, so all of these things um, are important things. And, you know, of course, industry is working on all kinds of ways to help prevent this, but I find that people using drugs and parents are experts at finding things that they don't think about that defeat our, our ability to control this. So not on purpose, but accidentally. Um, I'm gonna roll into cannabis. Um, this is what happened in Colorado with cannabis where you know Colorado had some legalization sooner than Maine did. And you can see here, as soon as the president said, yeah, we're not gonna go get people who are supplying or using marijuana, we're just not gonna worry about it right away. Um, there were more and more poisonings going on in Colorado. And you may say, well, it's Colorado. That doesn't happen here. Before we talk about that, let's talk about what marijuana does. Um, most kids get drowsy. That's not a surprise. Dizzy and, and coordinated, uncoordinated. That's not a big surprise. Agitated, rapid heart rate, vomiting, and seizures. Seizures is a surprising thing, but three out of 100 kids ballparkers that we know about are going to have a seizure. And here's the real kicker. Um, two out of 100 aren't going to breathe well enough and can die from that. So um, most marijuana cases in kids go fairly well. And if they're, if we usually send them into the hospital for monitoring, but not always. If you call us at the poison center, we'll work through with you. Is it enough marijuana to go in? But if they go in, not breathing well is not a problem because a hospital can manage that. At home, it can be a disaster. So this is just a heads up that actually this can be serious, even though it's just marijuana. And you have to think about kids are not adults, like I said before, with the opioids, but also the dose that these kids are getting in these edibles is in a naive kid with no tolerance, sometimes a hundred times or more what an adult dose is. So imagine somebody gave a person a hundred times a normal dose, and it makes a little bit more sense that they would get so sick. Um, and then if you're wondering, well, that's Colorado, what the heck, this is Northern New England. Well, Take a look here. These are kids less than six getting poisoned with marijuana. We're up to at the end of 2022, and this goes up all the time. It's still going up over 80 in a year. So it's it's a and it's it's rising with the availability in the home of the cannabis. Um, Dr. Simon, can I could I ask you a question that was sent in that is timely for this topic? Sure. Um, and I because I, I think a lot of people will be interested in it. I apologize for interrupting, but. Um, you've said that the calls can be confidential. Uh, under what are there any circumstances under which you have to notify law enforcement? Uh, yes. Um, so the calls are confidential. Um, calling the poison center is similar to going to the hospital. We have the same responsibilities, and I'll give you an example. So if you call the poison center and tell us your child got into a suboxone. Um, we will advise you to go to the hospital and have monitoring overnight. If you say, yes, I'll go there, our typical procedure is to follow up with the hospital and we'll say, hey, and we'll ask you, can I have the name of the child? And if you give it to us, we'll call the hospital. If you don't give it to us, we'll call the hospital and say, hey, we have a child who's coming into the hospital and it's a buprenorphine overdose and we'll give them all the information about how long to monitor. But um, if the parent 
suddenly decided they weren't going to go in. And I, at the poison center, know that a two-year-old with the buprenorphine who could die or not breathe well enough is at home. I'm obligated to report that. And, you know, more importantly than that, that child could die. We're going to try and find out where the call's coming from if we can and send an ambulance out to the house. And if an ambulance goes out to the house, the police are probably going to go out to the house. And so that would happen. And, you know, our first obligation is the safety of the child in that case. Um, the second obligation is the parent is not getting needed medical attention for the child. And it's mandatory as a healthcare provider that we report that. I'd be in trouble if, if we didn't report that. So that would be an example. I can tell you at the Poison Center, uh, we get, you know, almost 100 calls a day. For that kind of scenario to come up is less than half a dozen in a whole year for all three states. Um, so we do have that obligation. If a parent were to call us from the home and might not follow our recommendations 100% and we don't think the child's going to be at serious risk, we don't necessarily have to report that. And keeping in mind, just because your child was poisoned with something doesn't mean you're a bad parent and you get reported. We have 100 calls almost a day. Poisoning is very common. The bar for it to be a problem is pretty high. So just by virtue of calling and saying my child got into poison doesn't mean that you're going to be reported. It would be a very small number of cases in a year. And generally, when people don't seek advice, when we're afraid for the safety of the child. Um, so that's long-winded. Does that explain it? May I weigh in very briefly? Yes. On that, was, that was great. And go ahead, uh, Rob. Um, so just a couple of things. Um, one, from a police officer standpoint, uh, and, and I'm quoting Colorado law. I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with Maine or uh, New Hampshire, Vermont law, but we do have what is called a 911 Good Samaritan Law. It is specifically encoded in statute uh, that a person, and this this gets a little bit away from uh, from children, but um, can certainly involve teenagers and people who are, are underage, but um, a person is immune uh, from criminal prosecution for an offense when that person reports in good faith an emergency drug or alcohol overdose, even if that report goes to a law enforcement officer. This includes that person staying on scene uh, with the uh, individual who's overdosed and also uh, the individual who uh, suffered the emergency dro drug or alcohol overdose is also immune from prosecution. So that is something that the state of Colorado has decided is important um, in order to uh, help people feel comfortable calling for assistance when they need it. Yeah, that's very helpful. And, and we do have a, a very broad Good Samaritan law that under some of these circumstances would, would apply. So uh, thanks for that, Rob. Uh, but go ahead, Karen, I'm sorry to interrupt. Okay, no, that's all right. I think it's important. So um, this slide is busy. I just want you to look at the blue parts here. This is cannabis poisonings by any age in Maine by year. Um, and you can see we're up to over 100 a year here for including others than children. But all the blue is children. So you can see most of the problem is within children. The other thing that's interesting is uh, the pink up here is older adults, 70s and 80 year olds. And so, you know, there's some problems with their use too. And especially at the very old and the very young ages, these are almost entirely edible products and a lot of gummies and candies and things like that. Um, and this is the problem to a child the stuff on the left is non-marijuana product. The stuff in the middle is marijuana product. And to a kid who can't read, they do not know the difference. And I can tell you from experience, a lot of adults don't bother to read and they can't tell the difference either. Um, a lot of our um, exposures are due to lookalikes and kids getting into these products. And, you know, you can eat a lot of candy. I can in one sitting and so can a two-year-old. So that's where the problem comes in. And products that the left is Sour Patch Kids, the right is Stony Patch Kids. A child is not going to know the difference. And um, I can tell you, nerds ropes were a thing for a while here. Most of our exposures are brownies, cookies, gummies, and candies. Um, it's not necessary to have a pop product that looks like that. And we won't get all political, but I'm telling you, when cannabis products look enough like food products, that's where part of the problem comes from. And I can tell you based on the calls we get, 
it sounds like some of these products are coming from I don't know where, not maybe necessarily even in the state, but um, people are getting into them. So what can you do about the cannabis? Don't store any cannabis near food, candy, or medicine. Don't have it anywhere near there. Keep it locked up and out of sight and reach. And based on our calls, the uh, nightstand next to your bed in the drawer is not a place that is safe. Kids know to go there and they will. Um, and putting it up high, if they can push a chair up or a ladder up and they see you up there, they'll do that too because they see you taking it and they think it's candy or brownies or whatever they want, cookies. Um, so don't let them see you manage your cannabis either. Um, consider purses and visitors, including babysitters, who might have cannabis with them. Um, and then beware of block parties, weddings, and schools because mix-ups with brownies and cookies at those places um, is a constant source of uh, problem. A, at least two of our states are having programs in development and in practice that involve some child-resistant containers that are given with edibles, and I'm going to encourage everyone to please use those and follow some of these recommendations to prevent some of these exposures. So um, I'm going to go very fast with this. I don't expect you to remember everything, but I want you to get the general ideas, which I'll try and point out. Um, there's a stimulant problem that's growing in northern New England. And it's a big deal for people with opioid use disorder. And I'm not saying everyone with opioid use disorder uses stimulants. I'm saying that a concerning number of people with opioid use disorder are also having problems with other drugs, including stimulants. And while we're treating the whole patient, um, that's not something naloxone or buprenorphine is going to help with. So we need to consider the whole picture when we're thinking about what to do. This slide is poison cases in people who are 20 years and older in Maine. Over years, this big fat red line is methamphetamine. So it's not a huge number of cases, but we don't get all the reports of cases. We only get the reports when things are really out of control and somebody needs some extra help. So this is just, don't use this as this is the total number. Use this as it's a growing problem. So methamphetamine is a problem. That's a red line. The pink fat line is cocaine. So these are two stimulants and the dotted blue line here is amphetamine, which is mostly prescription amphetamine like Adderall type of drugs. So you can see the stimulants are increasing over time here. And um, you may say, well, is it just the poison center or what's going on? I talked with the um, prescription drug monitoring program. You'll see this data goes to 2021 because that's what I could get. But these are people who are prescribed buprenorphine because they're trying to deal with their substance use disorder and you can see this dotted blue line, this many per quarter are also getting prescribed stimulants like Adderall over well over 2,500 per quarter. Um, and since we know there's a poly substance use, I can tell you some of the cases we've seen, the picture looks like this, substance use disorder, put on buprenorphine, um, having trouble focusing, given Ritalin or Concerta or some kind of methylphenidate, um, and that doesn't work well enough, so they get escalated to Adderall, and then the Adderall gets escalated to higher doses, and then you start finding methamphetamine in the urine to supplement the Adderall. And at the same time, the patients are getting anxious and having trouble sleeping, so some of those guys are getting stimulants and sedatives, and at this time, it was getting close to 500 a quarter, which is, you know, that's therapy that doesn't really make a lot of sense. And then everyone tells you that giving benzodiazepines are... Those are like Valium and Ativan and Xanax with buprenorphine can cause some problems with over sedation. And we had over a thousand going up over 1500 a quarter of buprenorphine patients getting that. So, you know, this is some concerning stuff that I think people need to be aware of when you consider that a lot of times, and I don't know how many times nobody does, this can turn into cocaine and meth if it gets discontinued or patients want to escalate. And none of this is most likely in their best interest when they're trying to get better and not use. I was able to get an update to uh, quarter three of 2003 on prescribing in general. These are not buprenorphine patients. These are all people in Maine. And you can see this dotted line is the amphetamines. We're doing a little better on the benzodiazepines. More people are getting buprenorphine. That's a light line. But you can see we continue to have a lot of stimulants being prescribed when we know we're developing stimulant substance use issues. So a concerning problem that I just want to point out. Um, and you may say, well, who cares? It's not causing a problem. 
This is an annual death report from 2000 and, you know, it goes from 2009 through 2020, but this is methamphetamine and this is cocaine um, in deaths where it's contributing to the death. And you can see that it's a huge escalation in death. So I feel very comfortable saying we don't want somebody with substance use disorder going in this direction. And you may say, well, what does that have to do with opioid use disorder? But um, a lot of these methamphetamine, you can die from meth, you can die from cocaine, but a lot of these are opioids with meth and cocaine, fentanyl and other things like that. Um, and if you look at the death data, um, this is 2001, this is 2002, you can see all the fentanyl, which you expect and heroin, but look at the cocaine and the methamphetamine and it's increasing. So it's a poly substance use issue. Now, why would somebody with opioid use disorder want to use something like methamphetamine or cocaine? Um, there was a survey that was done um, with patients who were entering treatment and asking them, why would opioid use disorder patients want to use meth or cocaine? And the patients said um, more than half were just trying to get high and it helped, they, they thought it made a good high. Um, more than a third of them we're using it to balance things. The opioid makes them drowsy. They can't do anything. If they add meth or cocaine, now they can function a little better. If they're at a party and their pupils look small, it makes them more mid-sized, so it's not as obvious that they're on an opioid, all kinds of reasons like that. Some of them said that they couldn't get their opioid and it still got them high, and so that was why they used it. Sometimes it was easier to get. And then some of them just wanted to escape from life. And some of them flat out said, I'm addicted. I'll take anything that will get me high. And others of them got into it because it was available where they were partying and they just used it. So these are the reasons that the patients gave for why they were combining meth uh, with their opioid use. And it's worth understanding, I suppose. And what about these stimulants? Is it really that big of a deal? Um, in studies, it suggested, and this study in particular talked about it, that when you start adding the psychostimulants on board, you have higher mental health issues, that's a chicken or egg thing, which came first, we don't know. Um, more likely infectious disease issues, a lot of risk taking, um, more so even, and there's already risk taking going on, and social marginalization, more incarceration, homelessness, stuff like that. So it's not something we need in addition to the opioids. It just makes everything just so much worse. Um, so I'm gonna depart from that in interest of time and talk a little bit about buprenorphine poisoning. I told you that it's a real problem with kids, but I'm gonna tell you right now, ever since it came out, it has also been a problem with adults. So if you look at, these are just our poison center cases from 2018 through, literally I ran these reports a couple days ago, and this is about 735 cases. Um, and if you look, the most common poisoning related to buprenorphine is a self-harm attempt. Some of the, and I looked through the cases to see it's all ages, including people in their 60s and older. Um, some of the people are taking buprenorphine as the only drug, but most of them are mixing it. Some of them are buprenorphine patients who become suicidal and they take a suicidal amount of other drugs and the buprenorphine just happens to be there, but some of them also take a bunch of their buprenorphine while they're taking all those other drugs and it adds to the likelihood of them not breathing well. Um, we have our unintentional children overdoses. This is almost all kids that are six to 12 and mostly, you know, zero to 12 and mostly kids less than six years. A surprising number are using it to get it high, including people who are shooting it up, which is a problem sometimes because if, if they haven't done it before and they're used to using heroin, it puts them in a withdrawal that's very uncomfortable and makes them pretty sick. Um, and then we have people that we're not really sure why they did it. A bunch of people who are misusing it, not to get high, but for other reasons. Um, we have therapeutic errors, people using it in ways that aren't ideal, but a lot of them are the same as usual therapeutic errors. A uh, wife takes Suboxone and her husband accidentally takes it when he takes his meds, not really realizing it was Suboxone or patients getting confused and taking their Suboxone twice instead of once. We have a bunch of adverse reactions with Suboxone. A lot of it has to do with a little bit of withdrawal. Some of it is weird stuff like rashes. And then people putting themselves into withdrawal or sometimes getting withdrawal following their therapy. And some scary stuff where parents were giving their kids buprenorphine on purpose. So 
those are the types of poisonings and the amounts. And it's worth pointing out that um, if you look at, was it the only drug on board or how many drugs were on board? A majority of these were only Suboxone. And this reflects a lot of it, the little kids getting into it and that's all they got. But if you look, uh, a lot of them were multiple drugs on board and we had a good number that looks like about 20 or 25 um, there were more than six drugs. The highest number was 14 drugs all at one time. So, you know, the buprenorphine is, you know, people when they're upset or trying to get high or trying to hurt themselves will take everything. And the buprenorphine just adds to the problem list that we have. Um, so I'm going to break from there for a second and ask Dr. Palmer to be more vocal now, um, especially in his role as a medic and a police officer, Naloxone, you hear all the good stuff. When is it bad? And are these things myths? Um, it's not a myth that naloxone causes agitation, aspiration, pulmonary edema, seizures, and dysrhythmias. And those things are real. There are studies that show they're real. And I can tell you, Rob and I have both had personal experience with all of these things. Um, Rob, would you like to talk about when you see this, what it looks like, and and we can talk about what contributes it to it also. What do you have to say about these things, Dr. Palmer? Well, uh, there are a few things. Um, first, uh, just as a note, um, I've been in emergency medicine for about 40 years now uh, and worked in some large metropolitan areas, uh, Albuquerque, uh, the Seattle area. Um, so, um, I have uh, personally administered naloxone literally thousands of times, probably tens of thousands of times. Um, in terms of uh, what it can do, um, typically when we're treating someone um, in an ambulance or in an emergency department, uh, something like that, one of the things that we're very careful about doing is titrating the dose. Uh, so we give small incremental doses until the um, sick person is breathing adequately and adequately protecting their airway. What we don't typically do, or what we don't do, is to give a very, very large dose all at once. Um, giving a very large dose all at once is associated with precipitation of withdrawal. That's real. Um, and along those times, particularly when you're talking about people who are using multiple substances at the same time, you can take away the sedation that's imparted by the opioid, uh, and then you have unopposed stimulation, perhaps from the cocaine or the methamphetamine where you can get agitation. If you have somebody who's using benzodiazepines, for example, at the same time, they're, not, they're breathing better uh, from reversing the opioid, but they're still not protecting their airway all that well, so they aspirate. Um, you can have the pulmonary edema is uh, something that often happens when uh, an individual does not have uh, or is not oxygenated, pre-oxygenated well prior to reversing them. Um, in other words, their airways open and they're given supplemental oxygen and assistance in breathing prior to the administration of the uh, naloxone. Seizures and dysrhythmias are usually something that we would see. And by dysrhythmias, we mean abnormal beating of the heart. Um, and those are things that are not generally directly related to the opioid or the reversal, but it's typically associated with other uh, substances that are, um, that, are, that are used at the same time. And at the Poison Center, I can tell you, when we see serious problems with agitation, Sometimes it's just a patient that's a little bit difficult to deal with, but we've had circumstances where it was, we went from a patient who was maybe not breathing as well as they could, um, but breathing okay, and they were given a big dose of naloxone, and they partly woke up and might vomit, which puts them at risk of choking on their vomit and developing a pneumonia. Um, but in, in, the, in one of the cases I'm thinking of in particular, it created a situation in which several security guards were needed to hold the patient down to keep them from harming themselves and everybody around them. And um, then you're in a situation where, what do you do? Do you give them more opioid? Um, do you give them more sedation? And it becomes a very difficult challenge to sedate them without making the situation worse, but you need to sedate them to get the emergency department back in order for everybody else who's there. 
and to protect the patient from getting hurt and all the healthcare providers around them. So to, in the to, cases, it can be serious. To to uh, sort of um, step off from, from what Karen was just saying, um, what happens in the emergency department uh, or in an ambulance for that matter is we will resedate them, but often when they're resedated, that means that we have to intubate them or that is put in a breathing tube and then put them on a ventilator because they have to be sedated to the extent that they need um, invasive airway management. The problem that we run into is um, one of the, one of the um, cardinal rules of emergency medicine or medicine in general is you shouldn't be giving a drug if you're not prepared to deal with any and all potential adverse events that could be associated with that administration. So what we run into on the police side, for example, is um, let's say a police officer, patrol officer reverses somebody with a large dose of drug, that individual becomes agitated, upset. Um, he's now staring, uh, he wakes up, he's confused. He's staring a bunch of badges and uniforms uh, in the face, doesn't really know what's going on, gets, uh, gets concerned, tries to uh, fight his way out of it. Unfortunately, a police officer doesn't have the capability to sedate uh, and intubate a patient. So the only thing a police officer can do at that point is to meet violence with more violence. And that's a, that's a really tough spot to be in. Uh, obviously, we want to protect the patient. We want to protect people around us. We want to protect ourselves. Uh, but that's a really, really tough spot to be in. Which kind of brings up um, another issue about when to give naloxone. Um, and I know that you've seen this in your practice a little bit. If a person is saying, I feel like I'm getting sick and I'm pretty sure I've been exposed and I'm afraid, or the person tells you I took too much and I don't feel that great, is that a patient who needs naloxone, Dr. Palmer? No, there is one and only one indication uh, for naloxone to be administered, and that is uh, some people call it respiratory depression. Really what it is, is it's ventilatory depression. In other words, they're breathing inadequately, uh, and that's usually at too slow of a rate and too shallow of a depth. So rather than breathing 12, 14 times a minute, as we do when we're normally awake and functioning, this could be somebody who's breathing maybe four times a minute, two times a minute, or not breathing at all. But if somebody is talking to you, they're breathing. Um, and if somebody is uh, talking to you, they're conscious enough uh, that they don't need it. Just feeling funny is not an indication for naloxone. Um, this is a, this is a, a grown-up adult drug, and it has real grown-up adult potential complications with it, uh, and it needs to be treated with respect. It's a good drug. It's a valuable drug. It's a valuable tool, but um, it needs to be given with uh, appropriate care and caution. A general rule in poisoning is that anything that has an effect can have an adverse effect, um, and naloxone is no different than anything else. Um, so what can you do? Um, what are the actions that usually lead to these kind of problems? Um, Given it when it's not necessary, I think we just kind of covered that. Um, giving too high of a dose, um, using it in polysubstance overdose, and giving it without pre-oxygenation. And I think Dr. Palmer already told you that with some patients, if they're not breathing well, if you give them naloxone before you open up their airway and get oxygen, that can predispose them to pulmonary edema or other problems. And think of pulmonary edema as fluid in your lungs that interferes with appropriate breathing. It's a very basic description, but it's not a good thing. Um, Dr. Palmer, would you like to talk about any of the rest of these, such as a too high of a dose? I know in one study, they looked at adverse effects in anything, any patient who got over six milligrams had a pretty high um, risk of having a problem of some kind. And um, anything less than two, usually the problems were smaller, like tachycardia and minor agitation. But it, it's all over the place. Sometimes um, even less than 0.4 milligrams still can be a problem. What would you like to say about this? Well, the one of the points that you made is the numbers are all over. I could give you another study where it said four milligrams was a, was a cutoff for uh, serious problems. Um, it, this can be the result of a number of different things. Um, it can be, uh, say, an emergency department or an ambulance where... Uh, 
someone gives a large dose all at once, like we talked about uh, being inappropriate. And, and in this circumstance, it's usually intravenous doses um, when we're talking about e uh, in the emergency department or in the ambulance. Um, it can be somebody who uh, was impatient and just gave dose after dose after dose after dose uh, without waiting an adequate amount of time between doses for a response. Um, and generally speaking, within the emergency medicine community, um, we typically will stop, uh, and the recommendations within the tox community are typically to stop uh, at a total cumulative dose of two milligrams if we're talking about intravenous use. Now, having said that, uh, a single intranasal uh, naloxone um, atomizer is a four milligram dose. Um, so that's a, you're, you're looking at a, a, at a pretty big dose. There are some kinetic differences. The amount of absorption intravenous uh, versus, uh, versus intranasal are certainly different, but um, giving giving several intranasal uh, doses or giving uh, a number of particularly large uh, intravenous doses, um, the more you do that, the, the, more, the greater the odds of there being a problem. Um, and then the other things we've already talked about in, in terms of uh, uh, polysubstance use or uh, administration without uh, pre-oxygenation. Again, naloxone is a good drug. It's a very effective drug, but um, it needs to be treated with respect. With polysubstance use, um, it complicates things so much that it's almost better to intubate and ventilate a patient than try to reverse them with naloxone if they've got other sedatives and stimulants on board in terms of the safety. And that's a big statement because we don't like to intubate and ventilate people unless it's really necessary. But so you really, this polysubstance use complicates all of our management. On the um, other, oh, go ahead. That actually brings me to another point. Naloxone is not absolutely necessary to treat an opioid overdose. Um, an opioid overdose can, or opioid intoxication can absolutely be effectively treated um, by uh, managing an airway and providing ventilation for that patient. That usually would mean um, intubation and, uh, um, and ventilation. Not always, but uh, you know, can you do it manually? You can, but you're gonna get tired. Um, but uh, naloxone is not the only thing that you can do to reverse an opioid overdose. There is a question that came up. Uh, the adverse effects of naloxone are very concerning, especially given the push to get naloxone out into the main community who are not properly trained or equipped. Uh, Yvonne, I would, I, I, I would uh, agree with that. Um, I guess that's probably more of a statement than a than a question, but yes, Yvonne, I, I, I would agree with that. It's it's something that, um, you know, it's like anything else, whether you're talking about driving or flying airplanes or, or giving medications, uh, the more, the better you're trained in it, the better, uh, the better you're gonna be at it and the safer it's gonna be. And um, to address the first question, um, when the Poison Center talks about um, self-harm, um, our definition is different than typical. Um, our self-harm could mean anything from you actually want to die to I just want to get some attention. So if we list something as self-harm, it includes all of those things um, to get back at that. And um, and just to state the obvious, um, when Dr. Palmer was talking about an airway and ventilation, obviously those things need to be done at a hospital. And when people tell you administer naloxone and call 911, some of what we're talking about is the reason you may save somebody's life by giving them naloxone if they're not breathing well, but some of these other complications still could happen. And if we want them to have a good outcome, a healthcare provider needs to be around and make sure that if they do happen or if they get drowsy again and there's no more naloxone that they're taken care of. So it just kind of, I think it makes the point that these guys can't just be given naloxone and left where they are. Um, they need yeah. to get some attention. Right, and so I would strongly recommend any time that you're going to be giving naloxone um, that um, uh, paramedics be activated and uh, evaluate the patient. Um, there are uh, some data out there that uh, show that uh, outcomes are worse for people who don't, uh, who are kind of treat and release uh, from the scene by paramedics. Um, so it's a good idea to have uh, have medical evaluation anytime you use naloxone. One of the comments or one of the questions about um, the Good Samaritan law early on 
there's a lot of confusion about what a Good Samaritan law means. Okay, Good Samaritan laws also cover people who you stop at a traffic accident, and you help somebody. Um, am I going to get sued for doing that? Or am I going to be criminally prosecuted if uh, that person from the traffic accident doesn't survive? That's different. Uh, I'm speaking specifically when I mentioned the Good Samaritan laws, I'm speaking specifically about response to uh, a drug or alcohol related event and uh, criminal liability therefrom. So that's, uh, I hope that that clarifies a little bit of confusion on the, uh, uh, on the Good Samaritan laws. Those are we, we do have a good, uh, we have a separate Good Samaritan law, Rob, that just deals with naloxone and overdoses. But what you said is exactly right. But we do kind of have it covered. Uh, I want to, I want to be sure we, I, I think we can get through the slides. We've got about five minutes left. So uh, I'm going to try yep. not to interrupt and see if we can get through the slides. Well, yep. we're just about done, which is the good part. So we just want to touch on fentanyl because there's a lot of misinformation about how dangerous that is. And you see videos of people panicking a lot who just walk by a molecule of fentanyl. So I wanted to mention that and if you would like, Dr. Palmer, you want to run through this real quick because this is kind of your thing, you are a fentanyl expert. Sure. Um, one of the concerns uh, is uh, with police officers, uh, paramedics, uh, folks like that, um, what we refer to as secondary contamination. In other words, uh, I handled um, fentanyl in, during the course of an arrest, or I, hand, I took some fentanyl off of a, a party that I was uh, working on medically or something like that. Am I at risk to suffer fentanyl toxicity as a result of that? Um, there, as Karen mentioned, there are a number of videos you might see on YouTube or on the news or something like that, um, saying that uh, police officers have gotten terribly ill as a result of this uh, and suffered severe fentanyl toxicity. Generally speaking, well, 100% speaking, there has never been a documented, medically documented case of a police officer or other emergency responder suffering a um, medically proven uh, case of fentanyl intoxication as a result of secondary exposure. There's a lot of news about that and a lot of things in the lay press. Unfortunately, it's not accurate. Um, and typically what you see, and the reason that we can say this is because the toxicity that they're exhibiting doesn't fit with fentanyl. The time course isn't right. Um, nothing that you would expect to see is correct. What we're seeing is people um, having an internal response that we refer to as a conversion response or a conversion reaction. And what that means is that it's uh, the brain playing tricks on you. What the person is experiencing is very, very real to them. Uh, however, it's, it's um, based on the action of the brain, not based on the larger physiology. So the risk is actually very, very low. Um, don't lick your fingers uh, if you're an emergency responder and taking drugs off of somebody. But, you know, I would make that recommendation in a daycare center, too. Probably shouldn't lick your fingers after taking care of little kids. Um, you don't those taste what somebody's taken. Yeah. Um, those people who are alert and can speak are OK. We already talked about that. Um, there is no reason ever for somebody to self-administer naloxone um, it, 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 because if you could give it to yourself, um, you're, you're fine. Um, so remember it's naloxone is to be given to people who are not breathing well, and there's really no reason to panic. Um, it's the, the risk is so low, it doesn't warrant the panic and we can go on and, and finish with your, um, final slide there. Karen. Yeah, we're done. Um, essentially pediatric exposure to cannabis and opioids is a problem. We need to be aware of it. Poly substance use is a real issue. And then we need to be concerned about that with opioid use disorder patients, especially but everyone, naloxone and buprenorphine are poisons if the use isn't as awesome as we would like. And uh, fentanyl is not gonna kill you from a distance um, when you just happen to be walking by or handling something briefly. Um, and that's it. And I know that we ate up a lot of time. I hope people benefited from this. And Yeah, I, I, I wanna thank both of you. I think we got through all the questions, which I, I, I appreciate. Um, Madison, before I close, do you have any uh, any closing messages? No, I don't. Thank you, though. <laughs> okay. Well, I just want to, again, thanks so much to Dr. Simone and Dr. Palmer for putting this together. I, I think one of the things that's striking to me is that 
it, it's really good to have these balancing messages in, in that we do so much every day to promote buprenorphine and naloxone. We, the, the state has purchased, you know, through our vendors, um, you know, and distributed probably 330,000 doses of naloxone. And we do say casually, you know, it, it can't hurt anybody, you know, even doubt use it. Um, it and, you're hearing, <laughs> right, and you're hearing a message today that, well, that's not exactly the case. And I think it, it really is. We know there's a lot of diversion of buprenorphine. We, we particularly in our some of our incarcerated population. And so I just think this has been such a good important message that, um, again, one of the take homes for me is that, yep, uh, even good, you know, that dosing is important, but, but also this message that anything that can be good has a positive impact can also have a, a, an adverse impact at times. So it's an important message. I was so appreciative of having the Poison Center as a resource to all of us. And um, again, thank you so much for joining us. 